Omosi Nidishinzi. Greetings and good day, everyone. My name is Dr. Jolene Bowman, and I wish you all well. As we come together for this presentation, we are keeping the healing of our students, our children, our grandchildren in the center of the work that we do every day. Welcome to exploring the American Indian Boarding School Experience presentation, where we will go through an activity, review a historical timeline, and a documentary before doing a deep dive into the education at the Lutheran Indian Mission in Red Springs, Wisconsin from 1901 to 1920. My interest in American Indian boarding schools grew in 2009 as a result of an assignment that required me to research and present on American Indian boarding schools. I chose to conduct my research on the Lutheran Indian Mission School in Red Springs, Wisconsin because it was local and because it had connections to my tribe. During my research at our tribal Arvid E. Miller Historical Library and Museum, I found that despite the positive written history, there had to be more because it was contrary to the history of American Indian boarding schools that I had previously read. This led me to go out into my community and to talk to elders, which resulted in the oral stories starting to flow. I soon realized that the oral stories needed to be documented, so I wrote them down for publication and put them into this presentation. Another inspiration of mine came from my grandparents who also attended the Lutheran Indian Mission School because they were able to create a safe space free of historical trauma for all who knew them. My mother added to this when I was growing up by making sure I had the support and resources to be successful in school. On days when I did not want to wake up to the alarm, she would come in my room and say, it's time to get up. When I told her I did not want to go to school, she would reply, well, how do you expect to become president if you do not want to go to school? And if I said I did not want to be president, she would open my window curtain and let the sun shine in and say, sure you do, now get up so you're not late for school. Well, today I can say that I served as past president of the National Indian Education Association and as a past vice president for Stockbridge Muncie Community. You can also help to create a safe space free of historical trauma by surrounding yourself with positive sources where you can learn, grow, and explore. To work through trauma or someone's story begins with love and all the fixings that go with it to gain one's trust and to build an unwavering relationship. Getting to know others on a deeper level will help craft relationships that are free of distractions and open to endless opportunities. Modeling civility at the core of each day and expecting nothing else is a good start because remember, there is no such thing as a bad person, only a bad memory. Before we start the activity, I would like to share the understanding that during this period of history from 1870 through 1900, national attitudes and policy towards Indians largely focused on controlling Indians and forcing them to change. It was also a time when federal Indian agents and Christian missionaries exerted a great deal of control on reservation lands and they were often corrupt stealing the annuities and commodities that were intended for the Indian communities. This period of American history also saw the beginning of the boarding school era, a time in which American Indian children were forced to attend schools far from home and family and where their traditional ways of life were totally banned and severe punishments were given for even speaking a tribal language. The group activity we are doing next will help give us a more personal understanding of what the boarding school experience was like. To clear our minds of the outside noise so that we can take in this experience, let's get comfortable by finding a position in your seat that feels right to you. Now let's do some relaxing exercises that starts with looking to your right, then left, now up, and then down, 
and now back to center. Together, if you feel comfortable, close your eyes while you find your own center by doing three deep breaths, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth while I count you through this exercise. In through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Feel free to continue to keep your eyes closed and are open as we continue on through the exercise. Now that we are comfortable, relaxed, and our minds are clear and in a good place, let's find our happy thoughts. Those are the thoughts that make you feel happy and secure, like there's no worries in the world. Just breathe calmly as I talk you through an imaginary journey that asks you to think about what it would feel like if aliens came down to Earth and said they were going to take you away to another planet to be re-educated, shaped, and molded in the beliefs of the aliens. Imagine how it would feel like if you were forbidden to speak the language from Earth and would have to learn the language that the aliens spoke, have to study the history and culture of the aliens, and have to practice the same religious beliefs and ways of the aliens that included eating, dressing, and grooming just like the aliens. Okay, open your eyes if you close them. How do you think you would feel if this really happened to you? Now that we went through the imaginary journey exercise, it is time to look into the historical timeline, which is also available in a poster format, which I'll share with you later in this presentation. As you can see, the American Indian Boarding School is set to begin with the Indian Civilization Act Fund of March 3, 1819. It is not until 1875 when General Richard Pratt takes Apache prisoner of wars to Florida for a social experiment that Indian boarding schools start to take off. Here is a picture of General Pratt and a quote from him that reads, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one and that high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with this sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race shall be dead kill the Indian in him and save the man. Then 53 years later in 1928, the Miriam Report is published. The Miriam Report was a survey of the economic and social conditions of the American Indians during the 1920s. Data was collected by field work for approximately seven months with 95 different jurisdictions that covered either reservations, Indian agencies, hospitals, schools, or communities where Indians had migrated, particularly all Western states with any considerable Indian population were included in the field work. The findings of this report exposed the abuse, neglect, and failed American Indian education practices in U.S. boarding schools. Before reviewing the documentary, I want to remind you that there are clinics available in the room and to practice self-care by leaving the room if needed as the viewing of this documentary may bring out emotions that you were not expecting. The documentary of the trauma experience from those who attended the Thomas Indian School and the Mohawk Institute in Western New York titled Unseen Tears 
The Impact of Native American Residential Boarding Schools in Western New York by Ron Douglas. Due to the limited time, we will be reviewing part one now, and you can review part two on your own. I would like you to pay close attention to the quotes and reflections from American Indians who experienced a boarding school education, such as, what was life like in the boarding schools? What reactions did they have to this type of education? And what are some of the motives behind the movement to educate Indians in this manner? That's a song that was counting dead Indians uh, back on the trails when they would kill Indians. We'd see all these little kids in uniform, and we'd be wondering how come they're like that. We weren't dressed like that, but these little kids were. I remember being younger, growing up on the reservation, and being told, don't trust white people, don't listen to them. You never told why. The government schools are constantly being built and hospitals added. We bring them in, clean them up, and start them on their way to civilization. I would ask social services and human services audience, how many people know about residential boarding schools? How many people here do? This never makes it into the history books. This is never talked about. Why did those schools get started, and who started them, and what was the rationale behind it? And the first general policy was the only good Indian was a dead Indian, that we needed to be killed, exterminated, and eradicated. Um, once they realize that's a little bit more difficult to do is to have mass genocide of a population, the policies change to, from killing to killing the Indian and saving the man. There's a General Pratt who was well famous and documented for using those words to kill the Indian and save the man and that we are subhuman and that our ways are savage and we need to be civilized. Well, in the governments in Canada and the United States follow that policy up until the, the 1980s in one form or another. There is a boarding school far, far away where we get mush and milk for three times a day. Oh, how the huskies run when they hear their dinner bell. Oh, how the huskies run three times a day. Like I say, I went to the mush hall when I was four years old. I was there for nine years. And uh, once in a while we'd come home in the summertime, but not all the time. When the counselors came and told my dad that he couldn't raise us properly, we were at the mush hole one week and our heads were full of bugs. Well, there was a lot of sad times, but I mean, like, I didn't get, like, angry and have any resentment until after I got out. Because I didn't know, like, uh, from just from five and a half to 16, they would just thought it was just like a normal upbringing. Like, they not have no parents and stuff like that. Right. So that's what... Uh, and after I got out, and then they thought, well, this is the way they were supposed to be uh, treating us. 
think my mother couldn't take care of us because uh, our father was uh, into alcohol. Me and my sister, we started there in 1945. I was five years old at the time. We had all our hair cut off. We were made baldies. We were really bald. And uh, that wasn't a very good feeling to have. And uh, they used to call us the uh, mushroom baldies. That's what they used to, the kids on a reserve used to call us. Well, we can go in now. I mean, this is going to take like all day, eh? <laughs> <laughs> We were taken to the hospital to get checked out for uh, nits and whatever, I guess that was, you know. Uh, well, they checked us out, you know. Then, you know then, then they split us. The, the school was split in age group and by the boys and girls. Boys were on one side, the girls were on one side. And they went from the lower age up to uh, high school level. My mom was going to walk out here and go out this door and uh, and at five and a half I uh, my sister tells me that I grabbed my mom's leg and uh, you know, of course we were all just crying we were the whole four of us were just crying like you know because uh, my mom was going to leave us here so I, I grabbed my mom's leg and uh, well crying and that and uh, uh, just kind of like uh, hollering like, Ma, don't leave me, don't leave me, like, you know, so, but anyway, like, uh, while that was going on, like, the supervisor came over and just kind of grabbed me and took me off my Ma's leg, and, uh, and then my Ma just walked out, and I never seen her uh, for those ten, ten years that I was here. She never come to see me once. I don't know why. He took my brother away to where he was supposed to stay, and my sister, she just went on her own. I was with most of the four, year, four and five-year-olds. We didn't go to school because we were too young. Yet, through the agencies of the government, they are being rapidly brought from their state of comparative savagery and barbarism to one of civilization. When we used our language, we, at that young age too, you know, we were just learning. So uh, they used to wash our mouth out with soap. They would take the whole bunch of us and march us to the uh, shower, coal shower, and they'd throw us in there and beat us along the way. And that was a routine thing, I guess, I don't know. but. That, uh, ta that taught us, you know. They'd throw us in this dark press room where they kept all our Sunday go-to-meeting clothes. And uh, they'd throw Rosemary and I in there and uh, tell us the rats were going to get us. But uh, I didn't know then why I was being thrown in there. And I used to wonder, what did I do? And uh, I would cry and Rosemary would cry. And we cried and cried for hours in there not knowing why we were in there. And uh, they'd take us out. And when I did get to learn a little bit of English, I knew then they were throwing us in there because we wouldn't speak English. And uh, I must have been stubborn right from the day I was born because I thought to myself, I'll never speak English either. You want me to speak English? I won't speak English. So I didn't speak at all for two whole years because I figured if I spoke Indian, I could lick him. And uh, if I spoke English, then it would be against everything that I stood for. And so I didn't speak at all. But today, they all speak English, and some have taken business courses, home economics, and other higher training. Took us into another room down there, and maybe down in the playroom. We took all our clothes off, and we put the, uh, the clothes of the school on. Yeah, and they give us a number. So my number was like 48, and my brother was uh, 36. My family was the state-run institute, and the nickname for the Thomas Indian School is Salem. 
and Salem was derived from asylum. And you know what an asylum is. It's for crazy people. So we were thought of as being crazy, I guess. They were just considered bad people, bad children, but they weren't bad children, okay? They were placed there for, for so many different reasons, but not because of any kind of delinquency um, on their part. This part of the presentation will explore the written and oral history of what education was like at the Lutheran Indian Mission School located in Red Springs, Wisconsin from 1901 through 1920. The church was founded in 1895. The addition on the back of the church for the school was added in 1901 and the dormitory opened in 1908. These pictures show the rear view of the church annex which served as the school and the first dormitory next to it. In addition, these pictures show a male teacher with male students and a female teacher with female students in a canoe on Mission Lake. Just like in the 1900s, today we are segregating the sexes when it comes to education to promote individual learning. The first dormitory for the boarding school soon became overcrowded. Classrooms had 48 children crowded into a 14 by 23 foot room, and the children slept in seriously overcrowded sleeping rooms on the second floor, which was the attic where little daylight ever shone through. Due to the overcrowding conditions of the first dormitory, a second dormitory was built and opened in 1921 as pictured here. The first dormitory, which opened in 1908, now served as a school of three classrooms a confirmation, and a conference room. Notice the children in the front of the second dormitory performing a drill on the maypole in the front of the new dormitory. The maypole was a tall pole decorated with colored ribbons around which the children danced. The maypole was not part of native tradition, but was used in European celebrations for May Day. The boarding school staff consisted of a superintendent, a principal, two teachers, a cook, two deaconesses, a sanitary department person, and a custodian. There were almost 120 children enrolled in the school, mostly from the Stockbridge Muncie tribe, but actually 11 tribes were represented with students as far away as the Dakotas. The children at the Lutheran Indian Mission were mostly boarding students. They paid no fees to attend, but did have to help with work. Notice in this picture and the pictures that follow how the children in the group pictures while at the mission school are not smiling and they all have short hair. Each child was assigned to a job, whether it was hauling water, helping with the baking, laundry, chopping and hauling wood, peeling potatoes or drying dishes, among others. The jobs were rotated each month and the students learned every job. Sewing responsibilities were done in the sewing or mending room, which was equipped with two machines and a long table. The girls helped to sort, darn stockings, and put away the clothes until bath time on Friday. Children's clothes were numbered, so when the laundry was done on Monday, the clothes were put on a shelf by the number that corresponded to the child for whom they were intended. For the children, the day started at 8 a.m. with the Reverend teaching catechism and Bible history every morning for an hour. One might think the children did not learn anything else, but they studied reading, writing, arithmetic, physiology, language, geography, and American history. From noon to one, they ate lunch. Then from one until 4 p.m., the children were back in the classrooms learning. Here is a picture of the children during exercise time. Notice how they are in a straight formation, 
similar to a military drill, except they are facing their teacher and not a military sergeant. After classes and eating supper, students focused on their chores and responsibilities. After chores and before study time, the children were returned to the dormitory where some time was left for leisure time. During leisure time, the children spent time skating on the lake and sliding down the hills in the winter, and in the summer, swimming, taking canoe rides, and playing outdoor games. This picture is of my maternal great-grandmother, Mary Gardner Burr, sitting to the far left, Thelma Davids Putnam sitting in the middle, and Viola Jacobs Knight sitting to the far right in a canoe made by Alfred Davids behind the Lutheran Mission Church in 1915. Here is a picture of friends visiting the children at school on a Sunday afternoon. This handsome young man is my maternal grandfather, Clarence Gobe Bowman. Here is a picture of children celebrating Christmas in 1909 at the school. From 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock was study period. Each teacher took his class or classes over to the school for an hour of study. Assignments made during the day now had to be worked on and ready for the next day. After study period, the children were returned to the dormitory for bedtime. At bedtime, each deaconess took the children to the bedroom where evening devotions took place and individual prayers were offered. In the 1930s, the acreage of the campus was sold as a result of the depression and the second dormitory was dismantled. The wood salvaged from the dismantled dormitory was used to build the old Stockbridge Presbyterian Church in Morgan Siding. The school building laid in disrepair before it was determined to preserve it as a landmark. Due to Mr. Clarence Chicks and many of his friends, a program of restoration began. Today that restoration is a Wisconsin historical site and serves the community and the church. The church is still active today with regular services every Saturday night and additional services such as baptisms and funerals as requested by its members. The school is used as a hall for members to use as a gathering place to visit and serve meals. And this is my maternal grandmother, Leona Burr Bowman, attending the 100th year anniversary of the church with a Mission Kids reunion on August 8, 1998. As I continued my search for oral stories regarding the Lutheran Indian Mission, I heard stories of discipline that consisted of adult males rubbing salve on the female children, whether they needed salve or not, kneeling on peas all day, being horsewhipped with a stick called the Cat of Nine Tails, which was a stick with nine leather straps attached to it throwing a cat that became a pet to the children in the furnace right in front of them, raising both hands high into the air until they could barely keep them up, and if they misbehaved for the second time, the child was forced to sit under the teacher's desk, forcing children to watch and or babysit the staff children without pay and against their will, and standing against the wall without food, watching the rest of the children eat. Today, society would declare these types of discipline a crime of corporal punishment on a child. The discipline practiced at the Lutheran Indian Mission was not part of a child's traditional home life and culture, but did become part of some children's school life. The written history tells us the Lutheran Indian Mission was a great place that offered a good education. However, the stories told by elders tell us some children learn non-traditional ways of parenting and discipline. The children who obeyed the rules against their will or conscious recognition to survive took on a great burden by internalizing the pain. As others were led to trauma, many Stockbridge Muncie people rose above their painful experience only to remember the good. Here is a poster that summarizes in a larger context the historical American Indian boarding school with a deep focus on the Lutheran Indian mission experience which is available for purchase at the Arvid E. Miller Historical Library Museum located at N8510 Mohicanuck Road, Bowler, Wisconsin 54416 
or you can reach the Library Museum by calling 715-793-4270. In summary, the truth about the U.S. Indian boarding school policy has largely been written out of the history books. There were nearly 350 government-funded, church-run Indian boarding schools across the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. Indian children were forcibly abducted by government agents, sent to schools hundreds of miles away, and beaten, starved, or otherwise abused when they spoke their native languages. Thank you for your attendance and participation. It was most rewarding and inspiring to share. Anishik.